Watch this. In a span of 24 hours, two counties made clear what they thought of a controversial doctor on their public health board, and they weren't on the same side. So now it comes down to one county and one vote. Idaho's Supreme Court struck down one of the strictest voter initiative laws in the country. These legal losses for Idaho look like they've kind of become a trend and a pricey one. COVID isn't the only virus running rampant in Southern Idaho right now. West Nile is also surging, a dangerous disease we've handled before by spraying from planes. But like a lot of things, the safety concerns have spread to social media. And now that mosquito abatement is in a holding pattern. We do need more people to get vaccinated. The vaccine has been proven. Hundreds of millions of vaccines have been given. Um, so I would encourage people to do your research work there. But I also believe in the personal freedom to say yes or no. So I think people have to have the, their own choice on, on vaccinations and their own physical health. So I will vote in favor of placing Dr. Cole on that board. And with that vote, Dr. Ryan Cole is now one vote closer to being officially appointed to the Central District Health Board. That was Commissioner Sherry Moppin. You saw on that screen there off to the left. The lone vote of approval from Valley County, whose two to one vote they thought Dr. Cole on that board was a bad idea. Dr. Cole is now just one favorable vote away from filling that physician position on the board because Boise County commissioners voted this morning unanimously in favor of Dr. Cole. Chair Ryan Sturm told me he felt Dr. Cole was qualified and that he brings science and intelligence back to the board, something that has been missing since Dr. Ted Epperly left at the end of June, he said. Okay, so now back to Valley County. Doctors' opinions are what Commissioners Elt Hasbrook and David Bingaman said they strongly considered when they were deciding how they were going to vote. I did con get contacted by all three of our doctors up here, and all three of them were adamantly opposed to Dr. Cole's appointment and would like us to vote against them. And they've been wonderful help and a great advice on a lot of this stuff. and. Um, um, so I'm probably going to do kind of what their wish is and vote against him. I talked to a lot of our medical prof professionals up here and several folks from down in the valley, and I did a fair amount of research on both of the two candidates. I didn't get a lot of information on Moss, but we didn't get the opportunity to vote for them either way. So I'm going to go with a no vote for Cole as well. Chairman Hasbrook said they received about 1,500 emails or so, and a lot of them copy and pasted form emails, as you can imagine, but they were basically split down the middle, which is why he decided he was going to follow the medical advice. Hasbrook, who is also on the CDH board as the representative from Valley County, added this. After watching all three interviews and speaking to local doctors, I felt Dr. Cole was really not serious about the health district mission and the other functions of this great health board. Commissioner Bingaman sent this edition as well this afternoon, saying Dr. Cole's position on our current number one health issue, that would be COVID, quote, do not appear to represent the best interests of Idahoans or put us on a trajectory towards improving the current COVID situation. Furthermore, his public comments have only served to further pol politicize an issue that should not be political in my mind. Okay, so now what? Well, after Ada County voted two to one in favor and Valley County voted two to one against and Boise County voted three nil in favor, it now comes down to Elmore County, the other county under the CDH jurisdiction. If just one of their commissioners votes yes, well, then that makes it a majority. I spoke with Commissioner Al Hoffer this morning and he said they don't want to make a decision until they've had a chance to speak with Dr. Cole themselves. He told me Ada County commissioners got a chance to interview him. So why can't they? After all, it's a big decision for them, too. He said they've asked to speak with Dr. Cole on September 3rd, but they haven't heard back yet whether that's a possibility. And yes, they have asked or did ask for the same opportunity when Ra Raul Labrador was nominated, but they couldn't coordinate their schedules. OK, so what if Elmore County votes unanimously against Dr. Cole and it ends up tied six to six? then Dr. Cole doesn't get the majority threshold and the appointment would likely go back to Ada County commissioners. At least that's what we were told. And even CDH isn't solid in that assessment because as they told us today, something like this hasn't happened in recent memory and it likely won't end up that way. Sure. But if we've learned anything these many last months, 
These days, anything's possible. Schools are or are about to be back in session, and usually before the kids show up, the teachers do. About a week early or so to set up the classrooms and such, maybe meet the new hires, do some team building, apparently. Maybe you've seen a social media post featuring teachers from Victory Middle School in the West Ada School District. They start class on Thursday. It's not unusual for pictures like these to be posted, by the way. Let students and families know, yes, yeah, summer's almost over. They're ready for your kids to be back in class. But the comments and backlash from these pictures wasn't about what was in them, but what wasn't in them, like masks. Lots of close quarters and such in these pictures. Games with, you know, some straws in there. You can see a lot of people getting together. You know, those kind of things. You get the drift. And a lot of comments, like 1,500 or so, a lot of them were upset and bothered by the no mask thing. Well, as of today, West Ada doesn't have a mask mandate in their schools, so these teachers and staff, they weren't technically doing anything wrong. But as Dr. David Peterman, the CEO of Primary Health Group, who strongly suggested to the district that they require masks indoors, well, Dr. Peterman pointed out to us yesterday, when given the option of masks, well, this is more likely the option taken. Granted, we don't know all the details surrounding these pictures, pictures that are still posted, by the way, but we wanted to know more about them, and we got this in return. We are thankful that all the teachers have had the opportunity to be vaccinated. This past Friday was the first day back for teachers, and we are all adjusting to the new Centers for Disease Control guidance. Tonight's discussion at the Board of Trustees meeting will give them clear protocol moving forward. And yes, that's the plan to come up with some clear protocol when it comes to COVID-19 in the West Ada School District. There could be a consideration to change their mask recommended policy to a mask required one. That is happening tonight, possibly. That meeting is happening, but that decision could happen possibly. And that meeting starts in a little less than an hour at the district offices in Meridian. And just because they could change the policy, that doesn't necessarily mean they will, as we heard from District Superintendent Dr. Derek Bubb and Board President Amy Johnson on yesterday's show. They are hoping and expecting to hear from a lot of parents for two minutes at a time, which is kind of why they opened it up into the White Cloud Auditorium on that site. But you can watch that meeting if you don't want to go in person, and we'll have it live starting at 6 at KTVB.com. Another major Boise event is requiring everyone in attendance to provide proof of vaccination status or a negative COVID test. Boise Pride Festival, which was moved from June to September this year because of the pandemic, they announced on Sunday they will enforce the mandate as cases continue to rise, and primarily in those who are unvaccinated. It includes event goers, volunteers, staff, vendors, and even the performers. How will this all work, though? Katya Stepovic spoke with Boise Pride's president, Michael Dale, to find out. Some big changes, obviously, this coming Friday. How do staff members plan to check everyone's vaccination status and negative test results? It does seem like quite a bit of legwork. Yeah, so we're still building those pieces out. We need to make a decision first and foremost of how we're going to plan to do it as far, as far as how to announce to do it. So we got two things in place right now to work with the, uh, an app program called Bindle that will allow people to upload and self-verify either their negative test or their vaccination status. And then from there at the festival, we'll have individual checkpoints to verify those apps and see a wristband that'll be valid for all three days of the event. We know the breakthrough cases are rare, but they do happen. And breakthrough meaning someone who's already vaccinated comes down or spreads COVID or both. Um, what's your suggested mask use for vaccinated and unvaccinated? So we're going to recommend anybody wears a mask if they're not comfortable doing so, and especially for sure for the unvaccinated. At the end of the day, it's going to be the comfort level of the individual on what risk they're willing to put themselves at, but that's going to be our recommendation. Why did uh, the Boise Pride Festival come to make this decision in the first place? What went into deciding to do this? Well, we've been talking about this for the last nine months <laughs> when we first started about having to move Pride from our traditional June date uh, to September. And then the last really two months, we've kind of been following other prides throughout the country when things really opened up back in June and there was no protocol in place at all. So we saw cases come back up and had to pivot and say, all right, we're not quite out of the woods yet. How are we gonna handle this? So we met almost daily uh, via phone calls and emails and we engaged our public health partners uh, on the state and city level about three weeks ago to kind of get their opinion behind it. And so we kind of had two spectrums of the unvaccinated and the vaccinated. And so the take on the safety measures we take now 
covers everybody. And if we didn't cover anybody, there's more risk there than to cover everybody. And so we felt it was in the best interest to cover everybody and be responsible um, and make sure we did the right things for all of our us, all of our vendors, it's our attendees, it's our sponsors, and it's our talent. So the cover is not just those that are coming to visit as a guest. But it sounds like there was never an option to not have pride this year. You guys were going to make it work regardless. Yeah, that was our that that's been our our decision at the onset from moving it from from June to September. We had virtual pride in 20, 2020, um, which was a big hit. And because that was so successful, we are still going to broadcast all of our content online. So for those that don't want to come to the festival, still even if they're unvaccinated or just don't feel safe in general there will be an option to still watch the entire event online. So there is a way to still be engaged and in person to still follow along um, at home. All right, Katya, so this isn't the first big event in Boise to kind of have a situation like this where they're asking for vaccinations or negative tests. Mm -hmm. Tree four did it, but they're a five day event and they go for a while. They also have some indoor venues. This is a little bit different. Shorter event, most of it outside. Are they going to require this or how are they going to do this more than once? Well, they have that advantage because they're completely outside and as much as they would like to test and check for vaccination statuses every single day, Boise Pride is a free event, so they don't have the capacity to test or check three times or every day for three days. But because of that, if you're not vaccinated, they want tests to be administered on or after September 9th so they can get as close to that start date as possible. So kind of push it right up until that last moment to make sure what you're getting is the most recent. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Katya. You know, in baseball terms, the Idaho legislature doesn't really have a decent batting average when it comes to effectiveness in court. I mean, Mario Mendoza is like, well, at least I wasn't that bad. The latest whiff for Idaho, the ballot initiatives bill in the state Supreme Court, and it's a costly one. Hey, you have any non-COVID story ideas you'd like to share with us? Well, tell us about your ideas via text. The number is on your screen, 208-321-5614. And feel free to send in your questions and comments about today's show as well. Just make sure you include your name and the hashtag, the 208. All right, it's only been on the books for mere months, but those that write these laws into said books, well, they're settling in for another edit. The state Supreme Court ruled that a recently passed voter initiative bill is unconstitutional. Senate Bill 1110 became law back in July, and it increased the threshold for qualifying a voter initiative on a ballot. The Supreme Court has now reset that ballot initiative process to how it was before, meaning where the law said you had to get 6% of the voters registered in all voting districts, now it's back to the 18. Joe Paris spoke with the organization that objected to this new law and then immediately filed the lawsuit, Reclaim Idaho. They want to know about the decision and what happens going forward. We also checked in with Idaho lawmakers and got their reaction to this decision. It was wonderful news and, and uh, 
my heart was racing. It just kept on racing, and it, it uh, and before long, it was tears of joy. That was the reaction from Reclaim Idaho co-founder Luke Mayville when he learned about the Idaho Supreme Court's ruling on whether or not a newly passed voter initiative law was constitutional. Reclaim Idaho filed suit, arguing that the law made a successful ballot initiative nearly impossible. It was really something to celebrate to see the Idaho Supreme Court protect the rights of the people. The now rescinded law required signatures of 6% of registered voters in all 35 Idaho districts to qualify a ballot item. The law now returns to the previous requirement of 6% from 18 districts. It was unanimous. It was a powerful decision. It was a very clear decision. Democrat lawmakers like Boise Senator Grant Burgoyne are speaking out in support of the decision, saying it is a major win for the rights of the people. The whole purpose of the initiative and referendum is really to be a check on legislative power, and that's completely appropriate. All branches of government have checks on their powers. Uh, this uh, is a sovereign right of the people. The law in question originally began as Senate Bill 1110. Supporters said that it better integrated rural Idaho into the process. During the legislative session, this is what bill sponsor Representative Jim Addis had to say about why he believed in the concept. I think the more people you have involved in helping create law, whether it's in the initiative process or in the traditional process, I think that's a good thing. It is not a Republican, Democrat, conservative, uh, liberal issue. I think it's just really good policy. And if we start with good policy, we get better results. And that's what I'm for. Following the decision from the Idaho Supreme Court, House Speaker Republican Scott Bedke shared this statement saying, quote, Members of the Idaho House Republican Caucus are disappointed at the Idaho Supreme Court's decision limiting the voice of rural voters. These changes to the voter referendum initiative process would have served to increase voter involvement and inclusivity, especially in the corners of the state too often forgotten by some. We believe that all 35 legislative districts, every part of Idaho, should be included in the important process. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court apparently disagrees. Boise Democrat Senator Janie Ward Ingleking disagrees that Senate Bill 1110 benefited rural Idaho. She says, if anything, it silences all Idahoans while not promoting rural engagement. In fact, it, it uh, probably did more to discourage rural Idahoans from getting involved because they knew that one single district could veto, in, in essence, all the work of the entire the rest of the state. Senator Burgoyne says he wouldn't be surprised if the voter initiative process is taken up again by Idaho lawmakers. He points to the Supreme Court's opinion, which highlighted a long battle on voter initiatives between the legislature and the people dating back to 1912. This history goes back over a hundred years of trying to destroy this right. And the court has pushed back and pushed back hard, and I have no doubt that the courts will continue to stand up for the rights of the people and to stand up for constitutional government and to put the legislature back in its place. Mabel says his focus now returns to working on an education funding ballot initiative. He believes the Idaho Supreme Court sent a strong message to lawmakers in their ruling. Idaho lawmakers in the future need to understand that this issue has been settled by the court. Uh, the, the highest court in the land when it comes to Idaho has recognized the initiative process as a fundamental right that cannot um, be infringed upon at will um, by the Idaho legislature. And we've seen a lot of your questions and comments about this ruling over the last day, but a common question, and PJ actually texted us this we've seen over and over, he wants to ask about the legal fees and how much this is essentially going to cost the taxpayers since the state of Idaho lost the lawsuit. They have to cover the legal fees for both their side and Reclaim Idaho. While the exact number for this case specifically is still being worked out, we do know it is likely going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. The people I spoke with involved with the case today tell me that the exact number is not available yet, but they know based upon some of the amounts they're paying uh, legal consultants, it's very expensive in the neighborhood of $500 an hour in some cases. Uh, Brian, this is not new. The state of Idaho, uh, the taxpayers have paid millions of dollars since 1995 when the state set up the constitutional defense fund. Long story short, that's the pot that is paid out if the state of Idaho loses a legal challenge in the Supreme Court like we've seen them done, do a number of times over the last several years. Okay, really quickly, what's that number again that it could be for this one? It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars up towards maybe even a million. We will get that number as soon as it's available. All right, thanks, Joe.
Um, if we were to cancel the aerial application now, then I would just, uh, I would strongly implore that the commission reconsider that because um, really the West Nile virus is, is what we're trying to prevent. And our job as an abatement district is to control those mosquitoes where we know pr the disease presence exists. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? A government entity trying to get ahead of a dangerous virus in areas where they know it is surging before it gets out of control. All right, that was the director of Ada County's Mosquito Abatement Department, Adam Schroeder, imploring the commissioners to not postpone the aerial spraying for mosquitoes in several areas where they are known to carry West Nile. But they did postpone it. That plane flying late this evening and dropping minuscule amounts of insecticide will not happen once again. It was postponed last week because the pilot couldn't get out of Salt Lake City and it was rescheduled for tonight. But then the commissioners heard from residents and they saw the reaction to the planned spraying on social media and they decided they need more time to talk about it. Schroeder told commissioners this morning what he told us last week. They are seeing an overwhelming surge in mosquitoes carrying West Nile. In just 17 days, they went from basically zero to more than 77 positive tests in more than 43 trap locations. A record percentage, Schroeder said in some sites. All six cities in Ada County have West Nile. But the response on social media, he said, is a lot of misinformation about the chemical they will be using. Nail it. Several people pointing to the safety data sheet to illustrate how dangerous it is and how damaging that it could be to animals, gardens, and even people. However, as Schroeder told the commissioners, these descriptions apply to those handling the product raw, unfiltered, undiluted, in large doses. And the same language would be used to describe adverse reactions to something like chlorine, a product we use daily in our drinking water and swimming pools. And so that's really what we're dealing with here is that there's a lot of scare language about the SDS sheet and what that says. However, this product has been specifically designed to knock down mosquitoes and be safe for the environment, much like chlorine is used in our everyday lives. Scare language being used on social media, huh? Well, this is a product approved for use by the EPA and the FDA, it was pointed out. Not that that seems to matter much anymore. Schroeder explained they use about a half a shot glass of Dibram to cover an entire acre. And here's where they plan to spray, in areas of North Meridian Star, West Eagle, and CUNA. And that's about 38,000 acres, and it's something the county has done before, in 2017, in 2015, in 2013, and in 2009. Schroeder also explained to commissioners how this same treatment to kill adult mosquitoes carrying West Nile has already been used in Gem, Payette, and Canyon counties this year, and they have not seen any ill effects. Ada County commissioners decided to have a meeting with the mayors of Meridian, Star, and CUNA. They want to gather some more information from a few other experts as well, and then they're going to decide on Thursday morning if they're going to go ahead with this aerial application. We have more information about it in this story at KTVB.com.
All right, really quickly, Jim in Boise had this to say about Senate Bill 1110. I'm so glad to see my hard-earned tax dollars going to legal fees to defend stupid laws passed again and again. Bet it won't be the last, says Jim. And you know what? It's not like they weren't warned either. They saw this one coming. They were told it was unconstitutional and went with it anyway. You're right. It may not be the last.